Stanford University. Uh, computer systems school Oakland. Uh, this is Wednesday, November 18th, or excuse me, November 11th. Uh, today uh, uh, we have a, uh, a speaker um, who's going to be talking about time, which is a, as you know, a precious commodity for which we have almost uh, uh, an inadequate supply. Uh, but I want to tell you a little bit about what's happening uh, uh, next week, which will be the 18th. Uh, Amin Badat from uh, UC San Diego is going to come and he's going to talk about Portland uh, an issue of what you do to scale a data center network to uh, 100,000 ports and beyond. Um, the talk today, which as I say is about time, is about rethinking time in distributed systems. Uh, how can we uh, build uh, complex systems simply? And the speaker is Paul Burrell. Uh, Paul's uh, been around uh, the industry here for almost as long as I have, not almost. quite. Um, he was uh, a chief scientist at Sun and a uh, uh, CTO at uh, Veritas and is currently the founder and CEO of Replica Software. And uh, he's going to tell us about why physics is important to, uh, to us in terms of building distributed systems. Hey, thank you, Dennis, for that introduction. I appreciate it. So what I'd like to do today is to give you an idea um, of something that I consider to be uh, fairly mundane in physics, but um, may be considered fairly provocative in computer science. And so since I'm in a computer science audience, I thought I would give a, um, a provocative title or well, at least a mildly provocative title, and then um, give you a really provocative uh, presentation to see how things uh, work out from here. So um, I would like to ask the following from you. If, give me a 10-minute head start, because I need to lay some concepts down. Um, let me um, have another 20 to 30 minutes of um, presentation, um, interrupted only by clarification questions. And then the remainder of the time, you can, you can have a free-for-all. Um, it's uh, a presentation that's designed to last an hour. I understand I have uh, slightly longer we'll than that. half an hour more. Oh, 15 minutes. So we can have 15 minutes more than that. So I should be able to get through it. And I, I hope to uh, be both um, uh, interesting and uh, entertaining as I uh, go through some of the, the things that I'm going to describe. There's three parts to it. The first part is really a motivation. Why are we looking into some of these deep issues in computer science? Uh, and realizing that there aren't solutions in computer science and having to look in other disciplines for their solution. The second part I'm going to deal with is the main topic, which is what are the issues with time? Why do computer scientists perceive time one way and, and, and physicists perceive time the other way? And then the third part will be the, the question about, well, what does that lead to? 
If we were to solve the problem that we started with by going deeper into the physics of what time is, what would be the result? And how would we build more complex systems more simply than we can today? Because complexity is actually a major problem. So my motivation here came from several events in my life. Um, I was uh, responsible for putting an experiment on the space shuttle, which was literally the, the last successful flight of the Challenger. The very next flight um, blew up. And it, it, it shocked my world. It was a, I designed, I'd, I'd try to figure out how to build fault tolerant systems. And no matter what happened to my experiment while it was on board, I was able to get hold of it and be able to do something new with it. So I was deeply involved in fault tolerant multiprocessor systems design at the time. The second event was um, when I was at Veritas and um, the realization that um, when we were trying to recover the data for our customers on Wall Street and uh, the other companies around there, we discovered something very profound, and that is that the people who knew how to use our software, at least some of them, were no longer available. And on top of that, those people who were available were completely emotionally dislocated and were incapable of being able to do those uh, 35 command lines and 100 clicks that it would take to, to bring up some storage array so that you could bring the, tapes, the tape backup back. So it took us probably around the order of three and a half weeks to recover what should have been recoverable within a half an hour. And it shocked me because I suddenly realized in that moment that we designed the system wrong. We had designed the human being into the system. And so that put me back for quite a while. I went quiet. I went and did some research. I, I sponsored some research at the Santa Fe Institute on complexity theory. And I started going back and studying. And I studied for several years before I realized where the problems were. And the problems really come into uh, in two places that are showing up right now. One of the places is that you are very familiar with already. And that is that the, uh, the processor industry uh, is, in a is in a crisis, a concurrency crisis. We've run out of steam on uh, cl processor clock rates and all of the fancy things we can do with pipelines. And now what we have to do is we have to put up with um, multiple cores. I, I say put up with because there doesn't seem to be anyone who can convince me that they know how to program these things. Um, and there shouldn't be any reason why we can't. And everything that I've seen recently, including from the best stuff that Intel has presented, uh, has, has left me uh, somewhat disappointed that computer scientists aren't able to, to extract more concurrency from those cores than they are at the moment. And that's a big issue, I think. And John Hennessy is the person who highlighted that to me a couple of years ago at the CTO forum where he told me that uh, that we haven't thought about the software. We've gone all these years, these decades, of uh, relying on, on, on processes getting faster and faster, and no one really did any real deep work in, in concurrency. And, and that was uh, a, a good education for me when he said that. The second thing is, um, we have a problem in the storage industry. Most of my career has been in the storage industry, building large-scale systems, uh, deploying them, keeping them up, uh, rec doing recovery on them. And what I had thought I understood, I realized I didn't. And what we realize now is that complexity blows up on us. Complexity blows up in all sorts of interesting ways. And that's why I started to look at this uh, problem of complexity in a, a much deeper way to say, well, what are the effects of it? How does it scale? What are the components of this complexity? And how do we deal with it architecturally? So those are the motivations for this. Um, and I think, I believe, that, that there's a common cause. Uh, and the common cause is the way that computer scientists look at time. And I have to say one thing right now. Both computer scientists and physicists do not understand time. But at least the physicists will admit it. <laughs> So, what is this complexity crisis in IT? Well, if you go and talk to anyone right now in any of the large data centers, you'll find uh, just one statement after another about how derisive they are of the complexity of the environments that they have to manage. And they basically say it's just, it's in chaos, it's a mess. And everybody knows this, so the question is, why doesn't someone do something about it? And so it gets very difficult when you ask them, well, what's your definition of complexity? Well, apparently Seth Lloyd put a, a, a 140 definitions of complexity up on, uh, in one of his papers that, that was published. Uh, and everyone has their own favorite definition of it. But I decided to say, well, what matters? in a, a high-performance IT environment where you're, mo you're running multi-billion dollar companies and, and the, the, the integrity of that data and the persistence of that data means that the, 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 the organization, the, the enterprise, will either live or die if you don't do that job properly. And what I realize is that what matters then is complexity can be defined as the amount of work that it takes to bring a system up to its intended state of operation. It's a nice pragmatic definition. It also subsumes 
the definition of how much work does it take to bring that system back up to its intended state of, of operation after a perturbation. Well, what is a perturbation? Perturbation is a, a failure. It's an attack. It's a, a disaster. Anything from you know, floods in, in New Orleans to uh, fires in San Diego to earthquakes around here. And so I started thinking about this problem and realized that there's some things that we have to do. And what we've realized uh, in, my real, in, my, in my consciousness after the 9-11 event was that what we've done is this a very famous old statement by uh, Thoreau about um, we've become the tools of our tools. And so I set about trying to think through these problems and figure out how to solve it. And what's, what we're facing right now is actually not just a, a mild complexity crisis. It's actually a massive complexity crisis. It's holding the industry back. I think it's holding science back. I think it, I'm certain that it's holding back compu <coughs> computer, computer science. And um, I talked to Jeanette Wing recently at the National Science Foundation, and she has a very nice statement, which I stole for part of my slide, which is, how do we build complex systems simply? And so that is a deep problem. It's an important problem. And it's the one that I'd like to try and address to you guys today. But the reason, the motivation why we want to be able to solve this question is here. It's because we have a perfect storm going on. We have this complexity explosion that's going on. We have a, a, a whole bunch of people who are experts in the field on how to, to, to run these systems and keep them going or, or about to retire or already started to retire. We're finding that we don't have anywhere near the number of IT graduates that we used to have because everyone now wants to be a lawyer or an MBA because they can make more money that way. And then we have uh, fewer IT immigrants because um, of the political situation that we've been in. And finally, we now have this economic downturn, and so people can't afford to be hiring these people. This is a really serious problem. So the poor CIO, who tries to be the captain of this boat, is suffering um, in this environment. And I would suggest to you this is one of the biggest issues that we have to solve in IT today. Paul. Yes. I disagree with your assertion about the experts retiring. We have no experts at this scale. I think that's, an important, uh, that's a very important uh, point, that we do not have any experts at this scale. The thing that happens is complexity does scale, and it scales very badly. And I have a slide coming up very shortly that uh, I believe will... Here it is. So I, after thinking about this for a while, and I, I've gone into the whole issues of complexity in, in a computational sense many different ways, but you'll notice there's something very interesting about these three pieces that I put together. <laughs> One of them is, is a straight line, which is the blue curve. That's something that scales with n. In other words, the number of moving parts. And this is something that's easy to explain to a CIO. And then there's something that scales. It's actually go, the green line goes below the, 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 the blue line down here. But as it comes out, it, it breaks away from the blue line. And this thing scales as n squared. This is about the connectivity between things. This is a, n into n minus 1 over 2 as you, gives you an n squared as it grows. Um, and this is really all about things that software can solve for you about networking and zoning and land masking and all of the connectivity issues, they, they scale at this, at this, in, in this form as you grow. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this bottom axis, so even though it's scaling in N, I'm going to use it as a metaphor for time. So in other words, as systems get bigger and bigger over time, you're going to get more of these problems. The one that took me the longest one to understand is the third one. And I actually understood that from the folks at the... Um, uh, at the uh, Santa Fe Institute who were working on complexity at the time and I, I extended the model they had which was called the NK model N is the, uh, the number of things and K is the connectivity into the D model, the diversity and it turns out that that, that bottom one is the top one, the red one is all about diversity. It's about when things are different they become dramatically more difficult to manage. It becomes, if you like, a power set and you know that a power set is essentially an exponential. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. I suddenly started to figure out how can I deal with each of these cur curves separately as we design and we architect things. This led me into the questions about what the impact of that is. And here's the horrible impact that happens in this industry. If you were to normalize all three of those forms of complexity, and you all know what, I don't have to explain normalization to you lot, you just add them all up and make them equal to one. You find that you have a, a CIO's budget, for example, on the, the left-hand side here. Um, which is going from 0 to 100%. And let's imagine, just for a first approximation, that the CIO's budget's constant from year to year. I know it's going down. <laughs> but let's imagine, as a first approximation, that what happens is... It's scaling. <laughs> it's, it's part of the scaling. You find an interesting effect, and you see this effect happen over and over again. And I, of course, every one of my physicist friends told me that, oh, yeah, this, is, this happens everywhere. This is how things organize and self-organize themselves. What happens is 
If you put the value in the industry of the hardware, for example, which is the number of things you buy, and the software, which is the, you know, the, the software you buy to manage the connectivity of these things, and then you look at the, the diversity costs, which can't be solved by hardware or software, it can only be solved by what? Human beings, administrators. So what happens is the cost of human beings starts to dominate. And all of a sudden now, you find ourselves right here in the industry, about 80% of a CIO's budget is spent on managing what he already has with people and leaving only about 15 or 20 percent for new hardware and software. And there's, there's no end in sight to this problem. It just asymptotically goes to, to zero. So the pressures for this in the industry are absolutely enormous. And so there is a massive economic impact here of us not designing systems simply. So I hope that that gives you an impression about why there's such a strong motivation to be able to do this. So what have we done here? Herbert Simon said something very, very famous a long time ago about what happens when we design things wrong. They consume our attention. And our attention is an, is an important commodity. So I started to step back and say, well, what do we need to do to solve these kinds of problems? Well, we look at processor cycles, for example. They're, very, they're abundant. They're, they're free every year. We get more thanks, for, thank, thanks to Moore's Law. The same is true of, of network bandwidth to some extent, and the same, as long as it's local. And the same is true of storage capacity. So those are abundant resources that we can use to trade off against the scarce resources. Well, we haven't noticed, by the way, that we keep incrementally building on top of what we already have, what effect has happened over time. The two scarce resources right now are obviously human attention. It's a huge scarce resource. At the, the limit, that's, you can't build systems, and, and story systems in particular, any larger than the number of people you can hire to manage them. And secondly, the speed of light. Latency is a much more important factor in our computer systems and networks now than it ever was before. And we no, we're no longer looking at designing for performance where we define performance as bandwidth because bandwidth simply just gets better every year. We have to design for latency. Latency is fundamentally at the bottom of our design uh, principles. So what is, uh, what is this problem of time? So let's move on to part two and say, um, when we go digging down into the problems um, behind what I've described to you here in the complexity of how we design things, we suddenly start uncovering problems and we go down rabbit holes where we start to find things. And one of the things that we found was that the notion, for example, of transactions in the industry is all based on something called linearizability, which I'm sure that you're all familiar with. There's all sorts of variations of this. Essentially, it's having multiple threads of a program looking down into a single data structure on one machine. On one machine. And what happens there, though, is if that machine goes away, you have a massive complexity problem when you try to recover. Now, it's an interesting curiosity here because if you look at the dictionary definition of a transaction, it's nothing like the computer science definition. The dictionary definition basically says you've got a pack of cards and I've got $10 and we do an exchange and it's called an exchange quantities. Or in physics, we have a, a conserved quantities. We have momentum, we have energy that we conserve and they're exchanged. That doesn't happen in the computer science definition of a transaction. Instead, we have this thing called linearizability, which is everyone's looking with a God's eye view down onto these data structures so that you can do some arbitrary interleaving of who goes through that data structure and always guarantee that it's atomic. And when it's atomic, we're all happy and we think we can move on. The problem is that causes us to think that the only way we can build systems is to have a master copy. And that's the entire industry is built on this notion of a master copy. And you have slave copies of that, which are synchronously updated over the Hudson River, for example, and then asynchronously updated at some more distant events. And then when you lose your master copy, all hell breaks loose, and you have to deal with the, the ramifications of that. There's an interesting example of what happens when you go down the rabbit hole looking at the problems. And then when I look at the issues of, of transactions, I suddenly realize, and I, I, I discovered, and I'm going to show you a slide in a second here, the, these statements that I know are true as a physicist from my training a long time ago um, turn out to be not ha widely appreciated in the computer science arena. Uh, simultaneity, for example, is, is untrue. Causality isn't anything that we really have a good handle on. Time is not continuous. At least it doesn't behave continuous, it isn't continuous, and it's very seductive to try and think of it in a continuous way. Time doesn't flow. And at the, at the atomic scales, and in every law of physics that we have, with the exception of the second law of thermodynamics, time doesn't have a direction. It's bidirectional. 
We have this illusion as human beings of time moving forward in this monotonically increasing way. And it turns out that all of our physics equations don't work that way. So that poses some interesting problems. So that poses the question then, what is time? And it turns out to be probably the most profoundly difficult thing to define and understand. If you go and look up on the web about understanding time, you'll find there are arguments all over the place about what the definition is. And the physicists have been working on this for a long time, in fact, over a hundred years. And what we've realized is that we still don't have an answer for it yet. It, if you look into, for example, most of the, the leading edge research in theoretical physics on time is actually done in quantum gravity. When you're trying to reconcile general relativity with quantum mechanics, they basically don't go together. What happens is you find, you get things that you can't renormalize, you get singularities in general relativity that, that cause the equations to blow up, and there is no single um, uh, theory at the moment for quantum gravity. And there's, there's a lot of very, very, very bright people working on this problem. So I, I started looking at this issue and I realized that one of the things that's common amongst most of the people looking into quantum gravity to try and figure out what the definition of time is, is a lot of them go back and point to Ernst Mach. And he had a notion, which is a quote of, up here, that time is change. That there is no master clock in the sky that we're all, that we're all ticking in synchronism to. Now that's interesting because as computer designers, and especially in the EE departments, very often you're trained on how to build and design synchronous systems. And then if you look at a book on distributed computing, the first few chapters are usually about synchronous algorithms. And then they try to, to wrangle their way around trying to make them asynchronous in the later chapters. And I, I always found that very curious. And, uh, and so we looked into this a little bit more deeply and I want to uh, talk about the issue of time. So, for example, um, you might think that there's a, a solution here, but it, it turns out that it's much more subtle than you realize. Time, a, a relationship with time is absolutely intrinsic to everything we do in computing. It's, re it's, it's intrinsic to being able to modify our data, to being able to preserve our data, to give it persistence. However, the, uh, the understanding of the concept of time amongst computer scientists is far behind that of the physicists and even the philosophers. I would suggest to you go and take a look at a book by Hugh Price. Um, there's another one, um, H.E.W. Price. Um, he has a book about time, uh, which I think puts the physicists to shame. Its, it's, it's logic is impeccable. He actually describes the whole problem of how time, um, how we relate to time, and how inconsistent it is in all of the disciplines that we're dealing with. The problem with time in computer science is to computer scientists absolutely refuse to look at anything else other than a Newtonian view of time. So here's the problem. If fundamental flaws exist in the axioms of time, behind our distributed algorithms, then pretty much anything can go wrong. And what we will experience is that the, as we build larger and larger systems, more and more things will go wrong that we can't explain. Now, anyone had any experience like that with large distributed systems? <laughs> um, I, I certainly have, and, and it confounded me for the longest time. I mean, there was this, there's this folklore that um, only a few programmers really understand concurrency, and you put those really smart guys onto the, the core, um, you know, real-time library or whatever it turns out to be in your system. And uh, it turns out, though, I've employed those kinds of guys, and I've talked to them, and they don't understand it any better than anyone else. They just kind of have an intuition about where to stay away from, you know, the things that go wrong all the time, but they really don't understand it. And so understanding concurrency is a very hard thing. And the reason is very obvious. We're evolved as human beings to have thoughts that can be in a linear fashion. Literally, it's part of our evolution. Our brains, our left brain in particular, is designed for sequential thinking. So, I'd like to talk about this issue here. Causality um, is a myth. Computer scientists imagine that causation is one of the fundamental axioms or postulates of physics. And it turns out that if you look at physics, or any of the disciplines in physics, you won't find the word cause used as a postulate or an axiom. In fact, in general relativity, special relativity, and quantum mechanics, everywhere, time is a secondary concept, it's not a primary concept. And yet, computer scientists absolutely insist on using it as a, a Newtonian view of time. You might say, well, hang on a minute, this can't be true. Everyone knows that Einstein thought of, uh, of, of this was a problem, you know, 100 years ago. So, um, 
on this one, by the way, <laughs> I've got to explain something. I'm going to bring in another notion later on here. Uh, this is not a religious statement here um, about the belief in God. It's really about the belief in being a God as you're a programmer. And so the next slide basically says that. Uh, it's nothing to do with religion. I'm going to describe one of the issues that comes up in physics is the observer problem. It's about the observer and the system in quantum mechanics. And what we've realized is that the way we can understand time and the way that we understand the evolution of the universe is when we realize that we're all mutual observers and that there is no such thing as being able to be a, have a God's eye view of things. Now, it was nice to be able to do that in a shared memory multiprocessor because you can then have these, all these tasks having a, a God's eye view of the memory. But once you get outside of that machine and you start to get the speed of light delays coming in, this becomes a fundamental problem and you can't program that systems that way anymore. And there's a lot of intuition that I see uh, across the decades in computer science about this is an issue, but they've never really quite articulated it very well. And the physicists haven't articulated it perfectly either. So this whole idea of God's eye view, I'd like to bring into introduce another concept called a local observer view. If you program from the perspective of a local observer view, you are much more likely to get it right than you if you are trying to program things from a God's eye view. And I'll leave you with that statement as I go in a bit more deeply into this issue and um, talk about determinism. We know uh, very much that, that dis large distributed systems are non-deterministic. And, and a lot of computer scientists understand it somewhat correctly in the sense that, well, there's so many things going on, and there's so much uh, combinatorial explosion that, that you can't possibly know everything that's going on. Well, actually, it goes a little bit deeper than that. The whole notion of non-determinism goes deep down into the physics of the system. There is a fantastic uh, um, uh, uh, new result that came out from John Conway and, uh, and Simon Koshin recently called the No Free Wolf Theorem. And I strongly recommend you go and take a look at this. Basically what it does is it says this. If we as human beings have free will, then so do the particles that we're trying to observe. Now, they don't mean you know, in the sense of a brain that tries to make a decision about something, but they actually don't decide to show up where we want them to until we measure them. That's the whole quandary or the paradox of quantum mechanics. So, uh, where do computer scientists get their notion of time? Well, <laughs> we, a long time ago we had this, uh, this notion of a, uh, of a long piece of paper tape with holes in it and uh, we, we defined a, a beautiful theory of computability around more and more elaborate forms of this, uh, of this paper tape machine and now what happens is we call them computers and they run at you know, 3 or 4 gigahertz and they're pumping out you know, 16 gigabytes of memory and, uh, and terabyte disks on the systems and this whole notion is still preserved in the way that we program our computers we think linearly and the problem with this is that it's a very mathematically seductive idealization of a single mathematical object in R, in the real numbers. And that's why it, it, it appeals to our mathematics, uh, mathematical sensibilities. Unfortunately, it turns out to be totally wrong. It's completely and utterly untrue. So, why is that, true? Why is that the case? What would we do? Just to let you know that um, this problem still continues to this day, um, if you look at, and I have a great deal of, of respect for these authors, a tremendous amount of respect. They won the Turing Prize for their uh, a computability theorem that they had written several years ago, and I think it was very well deserved. It was a beautiful piece of work. But this is what they've written right at the front of their book in the introduction section. They actually quote Newton and say that we endorse his view of time. And this is very curious from some of the, the top researchers and educators in the field uh, quoting statements like this. It's very, very curious because this notion of time was actually proven incorrect over a hundred years ago. So, first statement here, simultaneity is a myth. Remember this, in 1905, Einstein showed us absolutely that the concept of simultaneity is utterly meaningless. And You've got to have an association between what happens when with what happens where. If you don't have that association, there is no meaning whatsoever because everything will have an appearance of a things in appearing in a different order. Now we kind of think we know that because if we have finite speed of something going backwards and forwards, then someone who's closer to me is going to appear to have events in a certain order and someone who's more distant is going to have events in a different order. And it's kind of, we kind of understand that. It's not difficult as engineers or computer scientists to understand that. But it actually goes much, much deeper than that. So 
the, one of the most famous papers and the most highly cited papers in the computer science literature is Leslie Lamport's Time Clocks and the Ordering of Events. It's, it's actually refreshingly um, p a good paper in many respects. It's got a lot of discipline in the way it was written. It was a, certainly a, 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 an eye-opening illumination to lots and lots of people over 30 years ago now when it was published. Um, and people still think this way. And the whole, the whole time stamps approach to dealing with time that came from that and also, there's a second piece in that paper which talks about the ability to be able to synchronize clocks arbitrarily closely. Turns out that's not true. Physicists will never agree that that can be done. And computer scientists have never questioned it. And unfortunately, all our programmers that we turn out from the universities uh, come to large companies and start to think that way and uh, design systems that way. And that, in turn, creates the kind of problems that we've seen. So the problem with Leslie Lamport's description of this, and he actually gets it right almost in his paper. I say almost, I don't want to go into some subtle details here. But he actually gets it much more right than most people get it when they read it. The happened before relation is absolutely meaningless unless it's associated with happened where. He gets it, but almost everyone that I've talked to who read his paper has never been able to tell me that, that, that those two things go together. And that's very unfortunate because it turns out that the paper was otherwise very good and if he was to rewrite it today, I'm sure he would rewrite it slightly differently in order to be able to get that point over. In 2009, this year, right now, computer scientists and programmers implicitly base their algorithms on absolute Newtonian time. And they use t Lamport's timestamps or some derivative of that, matrix timestamps or... Um, or vector timestamps, in order to be able to sweep their issues with time underneath the rug. You can't do that anymore. Our systems are going too fast, and we have a serious probability. There is a breakdown in simultaneity. This comes straight off the math pages web uh, page, which I think is actually one of the nicest descriptions out there, although you'll find probably hundreds of books and papers that will explain this to you also. If you have along the x-axis here this one dimension of space, and along the, the y-axis we've got time, so anything which stays in a straight line is something that's not moving. Once it starts to slope, it's, it's actually moving. That's very straightforward. Now if you want to send the light signals from one to the other, then what happens is you're going to get these 45 degree lines. So we're, we're basically approximating C equals one, so you get a 45 degree angle on here. So you can see a very simple breakdown in, in simultaneity when this happens. So that's not too difficult to understand. What happens next is if you try to say, well, let's talk about the simultaneity surfaces that uh, Lamport talked about in his paper, then you find that you can't, this guy who's um, um, the stationary, uh, until he starts moving, has got these simultaneity surfaces. And then if he moves very quickly, in other words, he goes from zero to, say, you know, 100 miles an hour, just like very quickly, then what's going to happen is his new simultaneity surfaces are going to conflict with his old ones. And so you're going to get this conflict of what you think is a time label on something. Now, it gets worse. If you, it, now, of course, we know it's impossible to, to go from zero to 100 miles an hour in, in zero time because you have an infinite, you know, G. Uh, you might have a very good sports car, but you're never going to get that fast. So if you smoothly accelerate, what happens is it gets worse. You end up getting a, period, a, a line or a limit of the region beyond which you haven't got any chance whatsoever of having any... Um, guaranteed time labels of anything you can put on. Simultaneity breaks down completely. What had happened in the description that uh, Lamport had, had, had made in this paper was that he'd assumed a continuous manifold. And even with a continuous manifold, you end up with this problem. So what does it mean? What do we do about it? Well, you might say, well, hang on a minute. What about we're in an inertial system? The, you know, my computer's stationary for all intents and purposes, and so am I, and, and so on. Well, I'm afraid that isn't quite true. Um, our computer's residing on a, uh, the surface of a sphere, you'll agree with that. That's rotating. I'm, glad, I'm sure you're, you'll agree with that. We're also orbiting a star, and we're also in a gravitational well. Did you know that um, when you go out and, uh, and use your GPS um, on your phone, or whatever it turns out to be, that if you didn't do the general relativity and the special relativity corrections on this, you would find yourself lost, like hundreds and hundreds of meters away over a short period of time. Inside one day, there's a 42, I th no, sorry, a 44 microsecond uh, maximum uh, outage that you would get on general relativity itself. In other words, 
Because the, uh, the satellite is in, a, is in a higher orbit and we're deeper in a gravitational world, just general relativity by itself for gravity will give us about a 40 plus uh, nano, uh, microsecond change. Now it turns out that the special relativity change, which is due to the orbital velocity of the satellites, the 24 satellites in orbit, that will give you a, a minus 7 seconds from that. In other words, it turns out the two slightly cancel. So you end up with about a 38 microsecond <coughs> maximum worst case. So in other words, your airplanes can be landing on a different runway or you could be taking the wrong, wrong uh, street. Uh, and if you let this thing accumulate, what will happen is over time, you'll, you'll be in a different state you know, than the one you think you're in on your GPS. So we can no longer ignore the fact that in our computers, um, the gravitational effects and the, the special relativity are a factor, are a function. The worst problem, the worst case, though, is this. If you look at Einstein's 1905 paper, if he basically defines a clock the only way that we know how to, which is essentially with a photon clock, with photons going backwards and forwards between two things, and the both trying to measure what each other is doing. It turns out the photons are max, Ernst max interactions. In other words, the interactions are, are actually creating what is perceived as the, the time moving forward for those two entities. So it turns out, though, we don't do that. We don't have photons going backwards and forwards between our computers in free space. What we have is packets going on networks. And what do networks do? Well, they have this stochastic you know, latency distribution, which, um, and, and the additional delays caused by routers and, and, and different dielectric constants in the, in the copper and the, and the fiber and so on. And if we, we end up with a very, very varied, very hugely varied, um, uh, latency that we see on a regular basis on all of our networks. So the, it's, it's, it's practically impossible to, to synchronize our clocks even without realizing that there's a problem of relativity behind it. So we have to look at this a lot more carefully than we have in the past. So one of the things that you might um, realize in, in, uh, if you read the original paper is, is that we can define what a clock is and what the time is from these packets going backwards and forwards. Now, if you've got time delays or going that, that are obeying some kind of stochastic di distribution on the packets on the network, that's kind of equivalent to acceleration because something that moves further away and each time you talk to it is further away or starts moving back adds an acceleration noise onto the thing that you're trying to measure. And so that w in, in itself will give you a different notion of what time is. So I hope I left you with the, the, the realization here that trying to create coherent time sources is, well, let me just say, problematic. Okay, what else is going on here? Um, other difficulties with time. So time is not continuous background. If you look at, there's a paper at the bottom of this uh, set of slides, which will come up in a second, uh, which will, uh, was written by, by uh, Lee Smolin, who is a physicist at the Perimeter Institute, and in, uh, in Waterloo, Canada, and he's written a fantastic paper about the, the issues of background independence of time. We don't know this for certain, but it, it turns out that there's no evidence whatsoever for any continuum, none whatsoever. It, in fact, just like there is no evidence for an ether to be able to transmit uh, electromagnetic waves, there is no evidence for a continuum. Time doesn't flow in the way that we think it does. And in physics, as I mentioned earlier, time has no direction. So how do we reconcile this with what we've seen? Well, Lamport's happen before relation defines a partial order. And what he also did was define these logical timestamps, which force an, or an arbitrary total order on the system in order to be able to uh, restrict the available concurrency. And that's essentially what we're doing, is we're restricting the uh, available concurrency of the system in order to be able to get a handle on the ordering of events that's coming in. Now, it's important, because if you're dealing with a file system, for example, that's updating a file, then you've got to get the order of events correct, otherwise you're going to get corrupted data. So, consistency of data depends on the correct ordering of events. That's a really important issue. This concurrency efficiency loss of going from a partial order to a total order is actually fairly massive. It wasn't that important 30 years ago, but now it's hugely important because our processes are two, what was it, three orders of magnitude uh, faster now? Um, probably actually, three orders of magnitude faster in clock rate, they're probably ten orders of magnitude faster in speed. And um, 
So what we have here is, uh, we, this, is just got, this just gets worse in a distributed system. The more nodes you have, the more spatial separation that you have between them, the worse this problem becomes. And really what's going on here is we as computer scientists are trying to make the system deterministic by forcing some ordering events because we've got this notion of time which is we're, we're trying to hang on to with, with, with our teeth because we're really fond of this idea of Newtonian time. This, I believe, is the heart of our failure to be able to uh, understand concurrency and be able to exploit the amount of concurrency that's coming to us free from the semiconductor manufacturers. So let me give you an example of, of a flawed set of thinking. Uh, in many, many, many engineering and computer science articles, you'll find diagrams like this. This happens to be one of mine. Um, where you try to explain, for example, what happens with a, a vector timestamp um, from what happens with three processes, P, Q, and R. And you can see very simply here that it's easy to define you know, what some path is through this and what the causal history is going to be and what some future effect is going to be. Notice that this is event 24, which is the one in the middle where everything's serializing through. Serializability is something, you, a, a, a term I, I suspect you all recognize very much. This is kind of what we do when we serialize things. This is another view of the system. And although we're kind of trying to have a God's eye view of what's going on here, we can identify now that uh, serialization is happening to a different point. And this is how we've taught ourselves how to understand the relationship of time to the events that are going on in our system. And this is, this is um, uh, Lamport's essential uh, legacy from his original uh, scalar timestamps that he had. And this is a vector form of those timestamps. The problem is, there's nonsense going on here. This line, this thin line going from here to here doesn't exist. And that line there doesn't exist. And the lines at the top don't exist. The only thing that exists is the tree of events that's going through there. It's the tree of events that defines time in your distributed computer system. So what happens is, what happens if, uh, for example, uh, process P doesn't respond with event 12? It sits there and waits forever. Well, what does that look like? That looks like the cap theorem, doesn't it? It's, it's, it's almost a trivial case of understanding what the cap theorem is once you start to realize that time really is the progression of events through the system. So, we're interested now in uh, how can we move this forwards and try to do things differently. By the way, these are the actual uh, uh, diagrams taken from Lamport's slides. So he made the same mistake um, of putting the, the lines um, between one event and another on a, on a single process um, and, and making them appear on the diagram, and they have no right to be there as far as the definition of time is concerned. But what he did do, which is interesting, and I haven't noticed anyone else do this before, is he used wiggly lines here for his events. And the wiggly lines are actually trying to impart an understanding that this isn't, this, this isn't a perfectly precise thing that you know is going to arrive somewhere at a certain time. There's an undeterminacy, there's, a, there's a, an error that you're going to get that will accumulate with distance and with, uh, with the effects of things going on. And it's surprising that other people haven't picked up on this terminology that he had in his very original paper. The interesting thing is that Lamport actually created some of this problem that we're facing with right now, but it, he also created a solution that he, he doesn't know about yet, and I'm hoping that he'll, he'll watch this video and he will contact me. <laughs> so, uh, what's going on here is um, we can consider the tick lines in, in these simultaneity surfaces that uh, Lamport's talking about in some kind of Cartesian coordinate system. That's what Lamport tried to do. Physicists would never do that. They would only ever use a relative form of coordinate system, and that's what we use in general relativity. That's what the, 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 the the metric tensor is all about, and that's what, the, what invariance or, or relativistic invariance is all about. This is barely consistent with special relativity. It's absolutely not consistent with, with general relativity. And so we know that there's something very wrong with the way that we look at things when we try to draw these simultaneity surfaces you know, and, and then try to assume that we can reason with our, my, our, our inadequate human minds about the ordering of events at something that's distant. We can't. The only thing we can reason about is the events that, we, that impinge upon us. The, 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 the packets that we receive, we can determine which order we receive them in. And that's pretty much all we can do. It's a local observer view. That's the only valid view that you can have of what's going on in nature. So let's move on to the third part here, which is... Um, how can we build complex systems simply? 
Now that I've defined the motivation and, I, and I've described one of the, the deep problems that we get when we go down the, the rabbit hole of thinking through the theory of these issues, let's see what happens next. So continuing to build story systems the way we do, I'm going to bring all these up at once, is, an, is, is a, a losing uh, uh, proposition straight away because we really can't continue the way we are. We're building massively complex systems that just get more complex every day. I was talking to um, the CIO of a, of a very large uh, company in Boston um, who had several data centers and had very large stands and I talked to him about well, what's the largest size of a storage area network you could build. So it's real simple. He says there's a limit on how far it can build, how quick, how, how big you can build it and that's it, it, when it starts to fail faster than you can fix it. <laughs> and so it creates the old tube computers, remember? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they fell faster than you can fix them. That's about as many tubes you can get in. The way we used to design... Uh, if you go down to the Computer History Museum on Moffett Field, you'll see all these tube computers. And, and I'm just astonished at, at the effort that those guys put into designing those machines because that was just a Herculean effort to be able to engineer those systems to try and make them reliable. And, of course, they weren't sufficiently reliable. And that's why we moved on from that style of doing things. And then... Um, the system requirements are actually changing very fast. We can no longer you know, take three years to design something, take a year to install it, and then have it you know, installed for 10 years or whatever else, and then slowly replace it. It doesn't happen anymore. The speed of business right now, the speed of every organization, whether it's government or whether it's commercial now, is so fast that we're constantly changing. So when you start your design, by the time you finish your design, the requirements have changed. And then by the time you've installed it, they've changed again. And six months down the road, they've changed again. And so what happens is, we now have to start thinking differently. We can't start thinking, or continue thinking, building systems the way we have done in the past, with a God's eye view, uh, we architect it once, and we build many of these systems, kind of systems. We have to learn to build systems, for example, that are evolvable. Systems that, that can be turned on, and then never turned off. Because parts of them are being changed all the time and they can evolve over time by getting better and better technology. But the system as a whole, particularly a distributed system, never gets turned off. So we're looking at, for example, uh, governments like you know, the Pentagon, for example, has a, a requirement for uh, being able to uh, turn the system on and not have to turn it off for 50 years. How do you do that? You certainly can't do it with the way that we've designed systems in the past. So we have no choice, basically, but to embrace... Um, commodity components. Um, it, we've reached the point where a lot of very large companies that have, have spent a lot of money on very high-end hardware have tried their darndest and done an, an, a fantastic job, but it, it, it doesn't ultimately work. Trying to make one system more and more and more reliable just becomes progressively more and more expensive, and it never works in the end. Ultimately, an airplane goes through that building, or it gets attacked, or there's a fire, or there's a flood, or there's something in which will take it out. So the whole idea that you can make things more and more reliable is a false concept in, ter in terms of design. You have to have many, many things that all basically work together in order to be able to provide the service that's wanted, that's needed. And this is what we're trying to do right, right now with cloud computing. And cloud computing is essentially the, the vision of being able to have lots and lots of e elastic computing resources be available to us. And if any one of them th uh, fails, then there's an automatic failover and there's load balancing. Except the problem is, as um, Larry Ellison so eloquently said a couple of weeks ago, um, clouds are water vapor. Um, and it turns out to be pretty much true. Almost every company out there, the vision's wonderful, but there's no, every company out there is cloud watching their existing product, uh, basically saying, you know, this is cloud computing by you know, repainting the product in, in this different marketing sense of what it really is. What's needed here is something innovative something new. What's needed is the ability to build systems that have got some seriously good theory behind them and not just more of the same. And so I would suggest to you as a call to action that we need to start thinking about designing our systems better than we have done. And we need to start looking at other disciplines on how to do that. And the other disciplines we can look at aren't just mathematics. They're physics, they're biology, they're complex adaptive systems. There's lots of things that can be learned out there from what other disciplines have learned about the way that nature works. So let's move on. Um, and the point I made earlier on is the most important one of all. We must trade off abundant resources in these new designs with the, for, uh, for the scarce resources. And skilled people are the scarce resource. That's the point that we started with. That is the motivation. So what would a new theory of infrastructure look like? 
So we need basically a, a cure, not some kind of uh, con you know, palliative or band-aid, one pile on top of, of the other. Because all that they do is they mask these failed architectural theories. And they there truly are, have failed. The failed architectures are those that, don't, that, that leak complexity all over the floor. And we have an interesting economic problem right now because if you're trying to build a business as I am, you, you start thinking in terms of a business person, you do these spreadsheets on your, your costs and, your, and your, 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 uh, how, how much you're going to spend on R&D and how much you spend on sales and how much you spend on marketing and so on. It turns out that we've shifted over the years and over the last two decades we've shifted from spending less on engineering and more on marketing and sales. So that means we're kind of constraining the engineering end of this. So what happens is the engineers are, c are constrained to do a, not as good a job as they did before. Now what does that do? That leaves bad designs to get out in the marketplace for customers to have to deal with. You also have only 18 months to do it. Now. And you only have 18 months. You used to have three, months, three years. <laughs> if you're lucky, yes. Nine months to do it. All right, as I like to explain to the VCs that I talk to quite often, look, you can put me in a room with as many women as you like, but you're not going to get a baby in less than nine months. <laughs> And it's true of engineering. It's very, very definitely true. So what's happening is there's this notion of econ in economics that's called an externality. Well, and it doesn't take two women mm -hmm. four and a half months. <laughs> exactly. It, so there's this notion in economics that I'm very, very uh, appreciative of now, which is called an externality, where someone else pays for the, the uh, result of a transaction between two people, between a consumer and a producer. So in other words, the you know, the, the, the carbon going into our atmosphere as a result of the relationship between consumers who buy cars and the manufacturers who create cars. So what happens in the engineering sense is we build systems with our software. As the engineers are constrained and constrained, what happens is they have to cut corners, they have to use what already exists, they can't do the fundamentally right thing. Um, and as you hear over and over inside the industry, you never have time to do it right, you only have time to do it over and over and over and over. And so what's happening is we're pushing the problem from the design phase into the, uh, the customer's uh, usage phase, into the operational phase. What does that mean? Well, it means that you're going to put software out that the customers have to have fixed because it's falling apart all the time. So then the, the manufacturers have to charge the customers these maintenance fees uh, in order to be able to fix the bugs that they should have gotten right in the first place. So this, what's happening is we're pushing the problem out. And so what happens is we get stuck in this incrementalism. And it may be an incrementalism that's caused by, by Wall Street's uh, short-termism in terms of looking at what companies have to do, especially when they're public, or only when they're public. I, 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 I heard um, um, uh, Goodnight last night um, from SAS uh, speaking about why he's always a private company because um, of this kind of problem. So we're looking here at um, how do we solve some of these problems. First of all, I would suggest to you, um, the first problem we have to solve is this distinction between the God's eye view and the local observer view, because these are very different programming paradigms. And, and there's a shift here in the mental understanding of what kind of, of, uh, of mathematics we use to understand these, what kind of, uh, of models we use to program them. And I've only, I've only mentioned one here. The, the, the thing I've talked about in this presentation has been about time and causality. It turns out there's just as much can be said about what's needed in computer science in these other two topics too. One of them is called identity and individuality. And that's a, a, a topic that's very well understood by philosophers. It turns out that we don't seem to understand it very well at all in the <coughs> computer industry. Um, and then there's this issue of called persistence and change, which is also a major physics uh, and, and philosophy issue. These are two deep issues that are just as deep as the time issue I've mentioned. So those problems are not ad adequately appreciated in the computer science literature. That is my claim. And here is the, the bottom line here. GEV designers, even if we were to give them enough time to design their products correctly, don't relieve us of complexity. They cause it. So I think that if we want to build products that don't leak complexity all over the data center floor, then what we have to do is we have to go back and reassess how we think about design, how we think about architecture, how we can build systems fundamentally simpler than we have been able to in the past. So what kind of approaches would we use? Well, some of these are fairly obvious and you'll read, you've, you've read about some of them. Decentralize everything. There should be no reason why you ever need a master copy of everything. Why have a master copy? For example, um, if you've got a, a, a cache, for example, why should that be any different to a backup? 
There's no reason whatsoever. It's just a replica. Um, other things that you can do include um, adaptive architectures. There's a lot of work right now that's coming out of different universities, um, particularly University of Toronto um, and other places, uh, about building adaptive architectures. Adaptive architectures are essentially those things that fix themselves. And it's not difficult. This isn't AI that we're using. It's a, it's a thermostat. It's like you don't sit there and, and you know, um, and move the, the switch up and down when, in your house when you want to keep the house at a certain temperature. You, you delegate that task to your thermostat. Well, that's the, the kind of, of, of complexity that's needed in order to be able to build adaptive systems. It's not complex at all. In fact, it's just the opposite. If you think about the whole idea of cellular automata, for example, as Stephen Wolfram had told me, if you make the rules between the cells any more complex than they absolutely must be, then the system will go chaotic. And that was a very profound statement. I couldn't believe how important that was. And it, it still today, it rings in my ears as being like one of the most important things I ever learned. Build the rules as simple as you can. In other words, if you're trying to build a, a data center or product of any kind, whether it's storage or something else, don't try to emulate what a human being would do on that system with some, you know, thousand line script. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Re-architect the system so that it can interact between the cells with simple rules. And when you do that, you get a system which is far simpler, far more robust, and far more scalable than you can do it any other way. So build systems out of independent autonomous units. That's kind of a, what I've said just a moment ago. But the important thing here is that um, when you make systems or components of systems, independent and autonomous, that means any of them can fail and any of the others can substitute in order to be able to take over the function that was on. So the whole notion of substitutability, which is related to identity in physics, allows us to build systems which are symmetric. And in, in, in fact, in large systems like Amazon, for example, you find lots and lots of discussions about how the, the nodes, for example, are symmetric. Um, build systems... Um, which eliminate diversity. Um, one of the, this is a hard thing to, to do in a commercial world because the customers are always going to want you know, a big one and a medium one and a small one and, or they may want a fast one or a cheap one. Or It turns out that this notion of substitutability is not the same as, I, uh, as, as identicalness. In other words, if you have a set of uh, servers that are providing you with files um, and some of them have you know, SSDs in them so they can be really fast and some of them don't, then what happens if you run out of the enough disks that are the, the uh, systems that are SSD based? Well, should you kind of like just close the shop and just wait until they're fixed? Or should you say, well, let's let the other systems limp along, only perhaps, you know, at a third or a tenth of the performance, but at least you're able to keep your business going while you're replaying, repairing the ones that you have. So the notion of substitu substitutability is one that deserves uh, some scrutiny um, and, and as, a, as an approach to be able to uh, improve the way that we're building systems. And then um, make systems manage themselves. R right now, almost every large manufacturer has got this notion of a container full of stuff that you can ship somewhere. In other words, they load it up with computer equipment or with storage, they ship it in a container and they park it in some parking lot, they, they attach water for cooling and the internet to it, and then they attach power to it and they, they leave it running. Why would you ever need to go inside one of those things? So concepts like rot in place are perfect. If you had a disk drive go down, why not you just like take the power from it, restripe the, 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 the volume that you have inside that box, and then come back up again, and you've got some graceful um, uh, uh, reduction in performance here, but the system still keeps on going. You can build systems that way. You can think about architectures um, in all, that can literally always either fix themselves or they can, they can, they can gracefully degrade in their operational environment. You don't want to be go going to be flying out an engineer to Iraq when they've dropped a, um, a container out there for, for some you know, you know, local data center or whatever else. You just don't want to do that. You want to be able to... And you don't also, the, one of the things that, that we do a lot as administrators of our machines and as the way we build our computers is we continue to think like in the God's eye view. We say, well, let me try and log into that machine that's over there inside that, that container and try to fix it. Let me go and do some command lines and let me go and do VI on, on the... On the configuration files or whatever else. It's like, no. Design it from the ground up to fix itself. And it can't fix itself, then you can't fix it. That's a very different style of thinking. But the reason that we've, done the, we've gone so far down this path is because we've continued to incrementalize. And it's incrementalism that is creating this uh, complexity crisis that we're in. <coughs>
So I'm going to start finishing up on these next two slides here about, well, what might we do this differently? I've already mentioned to you one issue about uh, transactions, for example. How would we design transactions differently if we were to invent an entirely new theory of transactions? Well, one of the things that we would do is we would go to an exchange quantities or a conserved quantities kind of arrangement. And to come full circle here from where we were with Lamport, Lamport had written a paper um, about marked graphs. And in the paper, he actually talks about, this is a beautiful mathematical theory, but I can't think of any, any practical use for it whatsoever. And it turns out he's got a theory of how you exchange tokens, just like Petronets, that where you guarantee that either this it has it or that has it, but you never have the case where neither of them have it or both of them think they have it. It's a beautiful theory, and it actually can fit right into how you would do uh, a new form of transaction that um, will be far superior in terms of, of recovery complexity uh, than existing uh, two-phase commit um, styles of systems and linearizability that's used in databases today in every single database I know of. So cons quantities can be conserved. You can conserve ox, you can conserve money, you can conserve tr minimum numbers of replicas and things. You can do anything that you want with this kind of approach um, far simpler than the way that we're currently doing it with a God's eye view style of programming. So this corresponds to, and when you think about it, Safe assumptions, even though the physicists haven't yet figured out what time is, we can certainly put a bound around where we think some of the dangerous assumptions are and stay clear of those. And right now, the computer scientists are charging all over those, uh, those places where um, the assumptions about time are incorrect. We know that for a fact. And what we can do is look more carefully at other approaches to building systems where we're putting a bound around where our knowledge is in physics or in other disciplines about where this notion of time is and so that we know we're not to go past that threshold because even though it could be correct, we don't know for certain that it isn't. And so there's ways of doing this to be able to bring things forwards. So one of my favorite quotes here is um, Richard Dawkins gave a talk at the, uh, the TED conference and I... He, he quoted Wittgenstein, saying, you know, Vick, and, he, and, and Wittgenstein was in a, uh, a room with a friend, and, and they were talking about why people didn't appreciate that, you know, the earth was round and, and so on. And people, why, why do people always say that it's natural for a man to assume that the sun went around the earth rather than the earth was rotating? And his friend replied, well, obviously, it's because it just looks as though the sun is going around the earth. And so his response was, well, what would it have looked like if it did look like the Earth was rotating? So, God's eye view. So what would it look like? Church used to say that, remember? Church used to say that. Somebody got burnt on the stake for saying the opposite. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So people would Just a turn the line. Transformation. <laughs> exactly. He would have admitted that he would have been burnt. So, um, I need the last slide up, please, please, if you don't mind. Um, my slide's gone. So, um, I believe that we have a situation right now of what would it look like if we were to find out what's going on with this God's eye, God's eye view that we're doing, if we were not able as designers to be able to reach out and directly control things as the number and the, and the connectivity and the diversity of things change. In other words, trying not as human beings to be the hero and diving in to try to fix everything individually as we try to do. What if we tried to, if we tried to do that, what would it look like? Well, maybe what it would look like is it would look exactly like what we're experiencing. It would look like this out of control complexity of robbing us of our productivity, preventing us being able to uh, scale our systems, and preventing us from exploiting the available concurrency in the, the processor cores that's available to us, and finally, preventing us from being able to recover from the perturbations that our systems will inevitably have to go through. So the uh, full, full circle here is going back right from the, uh, the quote that I have from Bertrand Russell earlier on. Um, why would we want to do this? Why would we want to rob administrators of their jobs? <laughs> why did we, um, you know, make the buggy whip industry uh, obsolete? It turned out that because the society that came afterwards was a far 
higher quality of, of life than the one before when we're all running around on horses. It turns out that the same is true. Ultimately, human beings should be reserved for work involving variety and initiative. And we leave those things that have to be done repetitively over and over again. We leave those things to machines. Thank you. So I, um, I kept my promise and got it to a, kept it to an hour, so I'd open up the, uh, the, the, the floor here for questions if anyone has any. Yes? I'll try one. You, you say, you, you emphasize a lot that um, simultaneity exists only at here, not. But the definition of here seems like it's pretty loose, and I wonder if it doesn't eventually come down to some kind of sequential machine. It isn't an electron in the machine, and it certainly isn't a collection of parallel machines. So is, is, is there, is yeah. the unit thing still the same unit you, thing for the definition of here? You're absolutely correct. If you look at, for example, if you look at um, what's happened over the years on the size of the die that people have for a microprocessor and the clock rate, there was a point where the one clock had a, uh, a speed of light radius that was much, much bigger than die. And then as each generation happened, that, that, that radius of temporality, the, the one clock, um, got smaller and smaller. So now it's actually uh, on a small area of the clock and every, uh, on, of the chip. And so you can't even synchronize coherently across the area of the chip anymore. Sure. That's going to continue. And the way that we have to deal with that is to say, well, this whole issue of serializability that we think we have a handle on is you have to start getting really, really careful about what you're serializing through. And ultimately, you're going to have to start serializing at the atomic level to guarantee in-order delivery and to give an ordering of events that can be, can be repeatable. And uh, the guys, for example, at Sun who designed the, the crossbow stack, the networking stack, have done a very good job of understanding that problem, at least to the extent that they have right now. So they've really gone to the point of understanding how serialization has actually got to be on a for different things, for the same thing in different channels, have got to be on the same core of the processor. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not, you can't guarantee serializability. So it turns out to be, your question is a very astute one, and I think that we solve that going forwards by being more and more careful uh, about what we're serializing through. Yes? So kind of the, the same thing, so can't you just understand your neighbors like the GPS example by just quantifying skew and then having a probabilistic boundary between things? That's a, a, a question obviously coming from a computer scientist. I'm an electrical engineer. Well, an electrical engineer. Even worse. Even better. So that, that is the old style of thinking. And what I'm suggesting to you is that is actually the problem right now. The way that you've been educated to think that way used to work just fine until our processes started to get too small and to get, uh, and, to, and now we have to be much more precise and much more in tune with what the physics is of the problem than, than, than looking at it that way. And I'll give you a couple of good examples. I already told you about the GPS example, about why we can't ignore general relativity and, and, uh, and special relativity. But there's also another one in something called decoherence theory. We no longer think about the collapse of the wave function, for example, as, as, as Bohr would, would once talk about it. And we had this hood that, you know, you, could, you weren't ask, allowed to ask questions you know, underneath the quantum hood. Now we're thinking about this as much more of a progressive thing happening, and there are things called decoherence times that are in the order of about 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13 of a second. Actually, that's not really fast. <laughs> if you think about it, those, that, that, those time periods are right in there where our processes are operating and where our networks are operating. So here's an interesting point. If you can have entanglement that can happen across kilometers with quantum cryptography, then if you look at the physics, you can also have, that's entanglement in space, you can also have entanglement in time. So it turns out that our, the computer scientist answer, or the E uh, uh, answer to, you know, we don't need to worry about these problems because those effects are happening, you know, at the, at the atomic scale, and we're still several orders of magnitude away from that, turn out not to be true. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle doesn't say that things happen at atomic scales. They say that it happens at all scales. And that it's just a, a probabilistic function of whether it happens at larger scales, uh, much less so than it does at small scales. So in other words, we are going to see the effects of decoherence between our computers on our packets going into our networks. And it's going to be more than just thinking about metastability. It's going to be thinking about what are the transitions going to be and are those transitions reversible? Uh, in fact, reversible computing is uh, what turns out to be one of the solutions to that problem. Well, I'll argue 
Okay, I'd, I'd, be, I'd enjoy Take that. The other. Yes. Uh, you talk about uh, not having a bot's eye view, but don't we need it sometimes to isolate some components that are not really feeling, but uh, giving wrong inputs or wrong, uh, feeding wrong information? Don't we need it to isolate it from the rest of the system? So if I understand your question correctly is, do, don't we need a God's eye view to be able to identify components and isolate them when they go wrong? Um, uh, that is the, the old way of doing things, and it, it's actually the way that almost everything is done today in large data centers, is you try to identify something on some pane of glass, some screen that you drill down into, and then you can actually isolate it and turn it off remotely or whatever else, or log into it and do things with it. That very style of, of administration and architecture design is actually what's creating the complexity crisis. And so what we have to think of in terms of, um, there's a, a notion in uh, biology that's called apoptosis, which basically means program cell death. So in other words, we need to be able to have components of the system have built-in circuitry in software or otherwise that recognizes when it's sick and says, I'm sorry friends, I've got to go, I'm sick. You know, my discs are failing, I've got all these memory errors, and I'm going to give up and gracefully go down. Or, maybe you have a situation where all his friends say, hey, <laughs> you're not making sense, would you please shut down? In other words, there needs to be some notion of, of, of things will shut themselves down, instead of us having to reach over and shut them down when they go wrong. That way, you can scale things uh, without having to, you know, grow the number of administrators exponentially as you're scaling things. Yes? style algorithms uh, where they vote to each other, like for instance in the in file system world, right. uh, yeah, uh, in, a, in a cluster where, you, where things are voting on each other, where they should be, a, should, should not be part of a, of a, of a, of a same functioning cluster, but um, are you advocating some kind of voting system? Algorithms, yeah. Um, the, the, I would like to draw a distinction here because I think you're on the right path, it's just that, that I think computer scientists haven't gone anywhere near far enough down that path in order to be able to resolve some of these issues. We have some very well established technology right now that we know all its warts of and it's called clustering technology. And what we've been doing for many years is we're building clustered, clustered file systems and they have a voting system going on and that introduces concepts like split brain and that kind of thing which throws you completely off because the whole notion of split brain is nonsense. Um, <laughs> because it, it turns out to be the same problem, you know, the, the, you know which, which, do you have a master neuron in your brain? Um, of course not. There's an emergent behavior which creates the, the, uh, the, the service that you're looking for from the system. And what we do in, in clustering in those voting systems is we try to recreate the notion of a master, but instead of having a single permanent master, we have someone who's the temporary master. And when he goes down, then there's some system of voting to say someone else comes up and becomes the, te becomes the temporary master. It's still the old style of thinking. It's basically saying, well, okay, a permanent master doesn't work very well, so let's try to have a failover so that someone else can take over a master if that one fails. We need to go beyond that and start thinking, let's eliminate the, total, the, the whole idea of masters completely until it's absolutely necessary. For example, when we're serializing something, something will temporarily specialize to be, okay, I'm the serialization point, and then when the transaction is done, he goes away and someone else can be the serialization point. So in other words, the, the fluidity of this the notion of consensus has to go far beyond what we're doing today um, in order to be able to, uh, in particular, exploit the concurrency that's available across all these cores that we get free from the semiconductor industry. So Dennis? how do you evolve simplicity? How do I evolve simplicity? Because it seems to me that the, the evolution in general is uh, uh, finding uh, better and better bandages for particular particular problems. And uh, I don't think that you get a total reset uh, towards a, a much simpler system with a slightly different set of rules and a better set of rules uh, in general. So um, nature has solved the problem. So we know there is a solution. It's a great die-off. <laughs> well, things do die off. Uh, <laughs> things do die off. Well, we know, for example, in, our, in the evolution of computer architectures, there used to be a, a huge fight between the people who wanted symmetric multiprocessors and the ones that wanted functionally distributed multiprocessors. I'm, I'm sure you remember that. Well, look where we are now. The, the symmetric <laughs> multiprocessors won the day, didn't they? But it wasn't obvious at the time. There was also a big um, fight at one point between segmenting virtual memory systems and between page virtual memory systems. The page virtual memory systems being a much more simpler and, and, um, and a symmetric system than, the, than the, the segmented systems. Even though there were lots of arguments at the time that they weren't as efficient 
So it turns out that simpler things do have much more robustness to them and they live longer and, and complex things tend to bury themselves in their own weight. Yeah, so I would argue this is the uh, SMP issue because SMPs don't uh, scale real well as the number of cells go up. <laughs> um, well, we know that's true now, <laughs> but, if, but if you compare what we were dealing with, yeah. If you compare what we were dealing with at the time between the arguments between functionally distributed processes and, and somatic multiprocessors, well, the somatic ones certainly scaled a lot better than the functionally distributed ones. We, we know that, at least. But now we're, we're having to say, well, what do we do now in order to be able to get beyond these? And we have to build systems that's in more than one box, which is what a somatic multiprocessor is. And we have to build systems that's more, in, more than a, a few boxes in a small geographic area, which is what a cluster is. We have to start thinking about things that are pretty much anywhere, and they talk to each other as peers, whether they're right next door or they're on the other side of the continent. Mm -hmm. And the technology exists to do this. The thought processes exist to do this. And we just need to change our style of architecture design to, to take advantage of it. Yes? I would argue that a lot of these concepts aren't new. It's that the current priesthood, to use your uh, first big flat analogy, believes in one way of doing things, like the S&P example, where there is a right way to do it. And all of the approaches must be wrong. So, <laughs> so maybe it takes a generation of priesthood to die off before we can get this right. Which is, which is, which is exactly <laughs> what I see happening with multi-core. Yes. People who were programmed to think perfectly linearly have a problem much like we had going from C to C++ in object oriented. Mm. There's a shift in thinking you have to do, and there's a reluctance to do that. And people who just learned multi-core from the start don't seem to have any problem with it. I, I completely agree with you. Um, mm. It's interesting. Steve Jobs gave a, gave a fantastic lecture at Stanford a, a few years ago, and, and he, he said that death is the, the, most, the, the biggest single most, most useful invention. Yes. And uh, you know, it's interesting, it's true. In, in ways, um, people who are stuck in their ways have to die off. Now, of course, that has nothing to do with age. It, it has <laughs> a lot to do with, with, with mental agility. Um, but inevitably, um, progress is made by new things coming and replacing the old, whether that's computers, architectures, languages, or people. Yes? Um, looking at the diagrams of world lines and so on and so forth, they look like highly lumped systems uh, in the, the discrete systems, in fact, space blocks. Uh, is, is, that, is that a good approximation? And where I'm coming from is, what, what sort of, uh, does your analysis say anything about what kind of uh, aggregation methods we have? What, what, what's, what's your lambda? So what's your function? Functional abstraction that we can use on, on these systems mm -hmm. to, hide, to hide the complexity. It's, it's a really good question, and I'd really love to answer it. Unfortunately, you're getting really close to where our core IP is in our country, company right now. <laughs> and so you, <laughs> you need to sign an NDA before I want to kind of have an open discussion about this, because some of this stuff has been patented and some of it hasn't. But you're actually right on the right track. And I, but I'll go back to you yeah, have 18 months. But I would go back and say... What, <laughs> yes. So um, I would go back to what I heard a moment ago from over here. Uh, a lot of this stuff isn't you. It really isn't. You can find some of the, the clues on how to solve these problems back through the literature going a long way. If the, the further back you go, the more clarity you seem to get in the way that people thought about these problems originally. Speaking of that, go before Einstein to Poincaré in 1901. Poincaré, yes. He asked you physics answer invariant. He yes. the right invariants, not the, not the Lorentzian. special relativity yes. that you fix later or whatever. Yes. Yes, there's a lot of fun going back into some of the old literature, and I, I, I'd only recently started doing that, and it really is uh, quite illuminating. Poincaré, for example, in particular, is extraordinarily fascinating to read, um, along with some of um, you know, Ernst Mack, and, uh, and even going back to Leibniz, for example, who defined uh, uh, Monads, Leibniz, Leib Leibniz, yes, depends on whether you're Sorry. American or English, I'm right? German. Oh, you're German, okay, well, you're pronouncing it correctly, yes, I stand corrected. <laughs> um, and so um, there's some fascinating things that you can learn from going back to the original thinkers uh, as they, as they uh, define the problems that they were looking at. And some of those uh, problem definitions haven't really been improved on um, over the ages. They've just gotten more confused as we put more intellectual effort from more people onto them. Um, it very, it, we, there's lots of answers. Um, 
I hope that I've given you some kind of um, instinct today for, for where to look for solutions. And, and also, um, if I was to leave you with anything, is that you know, if you want to make a difference, go back and distributed algorithms in particular, go back and examine the time axiom. Because if you build your entire mathematical edifice... Business, you should say time and space. Well, I, I didn't want to complicate it any further. It turns, <laughs> no, out, it it turns out that, that space and time are intimately yeah. related in more ways than you think. And yeah, it, I know. Um, but uh, but it, uh, go examine the time axiom in your algorithms and seriously ask if they are right. Because if you, no matter how much mathematics you build on top of it, it will come crumbling down if your axioms are wrong. Yes. Eugene. I don't believe the problem is necessarily in the processors. I've been convinced by all the people I hang around with. The real problem is how we build memories. We, we build them fairly homogeneously. People like Burton Smith and Ivan Stubble have convinced me that what they have to do actually is get away from that sort of how oh, we're not precisely sure. <laughs> Um, the, only, the only alternative machine hardware that I have seen implemented in the last few decades, Burton's heterogeneous element processor, which had fairly complicated semaphore locking memory, but it did attempt to address a few of these, few of these issues. So I would actually um, concur with what you're saying, Eugene. The, um the, well, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit of correctness to, to what you're saying here. The, the whole idea of, of the von Neumann architecture, in fact, I, have a, I had a slide on here which I, I kicked out because I, w I had too many slides, which said that Turing wasn't the only culprit here for leading us astray, that also von Neumann was. And in fact, it turns out that the, the von Neumann even more puts a stranglehold on our way of thinking about things, which is starting to become problematic right now. So there was a, several other architectures in recent decades that... Um, that try to valiantly go off in a different direction. One of them is the transputer, if you remember right. that. Um, I don't know if uh, we're going to end up coming back full circle to those kinds of designs. I don't know. I will. We always do. <laughs> we always do. <laughs> um, but maybe it was just ahead of its time, and, and the head processor as, as well. Uh, what I, the way I like to think is I like to think of, of the, really the question that you asked, and like, what is a node? And, you have to be, and as things get faster and faster and, and further and further apart, you have to be more careful about what you're defining as a node because if something has any spatial extent, then you have to think about exactly what part of it are you serializing through in order to be able to guarantee the in-order uh, delivery of events. Now, it turns out that Hurley here, who I um, implicitly criticized for, because of this time axiom that they, they put in their book, actually does think correctly about a lot of these issues. For example, on transactional memory, you actually are serializing through the memory itself. And you're doing that in a way where the memory elements are allowing you to make things appear to be atomic without having to wait for them. It's actually a brilliant style of thinking that gets you halfway to a solution. It doesn't get you all the way to what I believe is necessary with the conserved quantity style of solutions. It's stuck on linearization. It's stuck on linearization, yes. Linearizability is what he and, and Jeanette Wing, of course, made very famous. With him over it. And then at the end, he said, he gave a talk here, beautiful theory, everything. At the end, he basically completely switched pragmatic. He threw the theory out and said, oh, let's do some existing software. And then he tried to nail it out. Well, I'd love to have a, have a conversation with him. He is someone that I have a great deal of respect for. Yeah, nail him on linearization. Yes. Paul, I think it's time to, to stop answering questions to the larger group and pick it up in front of the desk here. Okay. And thank you very much for giving us a great talk. Okay. Absolutely. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.